significant technical issues with the webinar room here. All right, and so with that. Thanks, Beth. Hi, I'm Carrie Little Brown, and I'm one of the dissertation editors in the what is now called the Office of Academic Editing in the Walden Writing Center. And the group that I'm in is responsible chiefly for the form and style review, which um, most of you have probably heard something about. That happens near the end of the capstone approval process, after the final URR review and before the oral presentation. And during that process, we look at um, and actually do some editing in um, and make uh, suggested changes to every document, spending between six and 10 hours with each document. So this presentation on revising and self-editing the doctoral capstone is very close to my heart and I think to the hearts of those in my team um, because this is very much uh, central to the work that I do. Um, and so I'm excited about sharing some techniques that um, we've developed for revising and proofreading um, that I know I apply actually when working with my own academic writing as well as in my work as a form and style editor. And um, I hope that will be useful to you. Um, as Beth mentioned, we're going to be having some polls and chats throughout this presentation um, so that I can get a little bit more information about your experiences with revising and editing uh, your doctoral writing. All right. Okay, so there are four primary things that we're going to do in this session. Um, and ideally, after this webinar is over, you should be able to do the following. Um, understand how to prioritize revision and proofreading tasks when you're preparing your doctoral capstone. Um, how to think about kind of segmenting and ordering those tasks. And that's actually a big part of this presentation is, is thinking about how to approach that in terms of strategy. And we're going to talk about revision generally um, after outlining what I would propose are the differences between revision and proofreading. We'll talk about revision then um, and what are some good strategies to use when you are working with a longer document like a capstone over a much longer period of time than you may have worked on any document previously, um, where you're receiving multiple rounds of feedback from multiple people who may have their own um, focuses and agendas uh, that you have to reconcile in all of your own revisions. Then we're going to talk about the more granular proofreading tasks um, and what's involved in polishing that manuscript um, to produce that you know, really professional final study. Uh, and then at the end of the presentation, I'll be introducing a variety of resources that we offer through the Writing Center and other centers at Walden that can be especially helpful to you as you're revising and editing, proofreading your work. Um, uh, as Beth mentioned, please feel free to um, ask questions in the Q&A box. I've uh, let Sam know too to feel free to interrupt me at any point if there is any need for clarification um, or expansion on anything that we're talking about. Okay, as I mentioned on the last slide, one of the ideas in this presentation is that there is a useful distinction that can be made between revising as a task and proofreading as a task. And this slide gets to the heart of that. So the idea behind uh, revising in this model is that revising is more of a global or big picture task. When you're revising, you're looking at issues of content and meaning and flow and overall kind of macro structure of the argument. Um, and again, I think of revision as being a very content and meaning driven kind of process. Um, so at that point, you're looking at when you're revising the draft, you're looking at organization, idea development, uh, clarity and coherence. Um, the flow of, from one idea to the next within paragraphs and between paragraphs, that kind of thing. Um, and we tend to say uh, among the form and style editors when we're advising students at earlier stages of the process um, in some of the other capacities in which we work, <coughs> excuse me, that revising should be approached first because um, as you're moving content around and as you're changing that content and that mi microstructure, you're making broader changes that um, 
could end up undoing that more granular level polishing. So it tends to be most productive to deal with the broad revision task first. Um, and that can be, you know, a fairly lengthy stage of the writing and revision process. And then in contrast, proofreading then is that what you might think of as copy editing or, um, you know, or, you know, we often use the term proofreading to talk about this, that's addressing more of that granular, local, small picture issues in a draft. Um, you know, are you following APA rules for your citations and references and, you know, for different kinds of formal things like the use of numbers and that kind of thing? Um, are your, you know, are all of your verbs presented correctly? Have all of your tenses correct? Um, are you using full and complete sentences? Um, are you choosing the best words to convey the individual ideas? Proofreading tends to work more at that word or sentence level. Revision works more at the kind of paragraph and chapter and argument kind of level. And so proofreading, you know, is that final kind of pass or number of passes that you'll do in your work before you submit that uh, very final draft. Although, of course, there are going to be proofreading stages um, throughout the capstone process, too, as you're completing and submitting um, your best versions of various components of the work to the people who are reading them. Now, one thing to keep in mind as you're going about uh, what can be sometimes a kind of overwhelming feeling process of, of approaching in the self-editing of your own work throughout writing the capstone is that it's usually, I would say, certainly for me, despite having edited for many years, I simply cannot address everything, you know, in a text in one pass. Um, and I think most of my colleagues would agree with me. And I, I think if you try to do that, it makes for a very frustrating process. Um, I would argue, and I think there's a basis for this, although I certainly can't offer you um, some real solid citations about this, but I'm sure they exist. Um, I think that the argument level of your writing really uses a different part of the mind. Um, it certainly feels that way for me than that more granular you know, making sure all of my punctuation is correct and spell checking part of my mind. And, you know, and the load of trying to keep all of those things active really is too much, I think, for most people. So part of being an effective self-editor is learning how to prioritize, order, and plan for the various kind of stages of revision and proofreading in your document. And a general principle guiding that that I've found to be really useful um, as I've refine my own approach, as I said, to my own work as well as to editing other people's work, is deciding what I'm focusing on in a specific pass if I'm doing an intensive edit of a document. Um, and to move again from the big picture concerns um, to the small picture concerns, usually in separate passes through it. Um, dividing the draft into pieces when you're revising your own work can be really helpful. Um, not trying to run a marathon unless you really want that kind of immersive focus. Um, you know, thinking about how to segment that work um, and how to segment the editing task into manageable pieces can be really helpful. So there's some general questions to keep in mind um, as you're revising and proofreading um, your capstone kind of throughout the process. Um, are you addressing the requirements of your degree program? And we'll be talking a bit more about the resources you can use to ascertain that you're doing that. Um, are you presenting the best version of what you wanted to say? Are you presenting your content um, in the most effective, most streamlined, most focused, and most coherent way? And are you following the guidance and recommendations of your faculty so that you can move forward you know, into the next step um, of that approval process? So we're going to talk a bit more about, you know, this broad revision, um, you know, content-driven approach. But before that, I have a poll. I was curious to see how you answered. And the question is, how long do you typically spend revising a draft between submissions? And by that, we mean when you have to submit something to your chair or, you know, other faculty um, and you get it back. How long do you take with that draft? 
on average before you submit it again. And I see some responses coming in. I'll give that a few more moments. And this is always really fun for me to see because this is a part of this process that as a foreman style editor, um, I don't have as much exposure to. Well, it looks like there's a clear winner <laughs> among the uh, results, although I see, uh, I think, okay, it looks like we might be, I think we might be done getting responses. It looks like most people are saying a few days, it's about 72%. Um, and that seems reasonable to me. Um, and of course there's going to be, and some people are saying a few weeks, uh, we have 19% saying several hours. There's no right answer uh, to any of this. So I think that's interesting to see. I think, you know, a few days, you know, or longer is, can be really helpful just in spreading out that process. I think it helps to not feel quite so time pressured and um, frustrated. Not that this process ever gets frustrating, <laughs> but I think perhaps sometimes it can. Okay, Beth, I think, yeah, I think we can end the poll. Okay, thank you for contributing to that. I think that's interesting. All right, so as I said, this next section of the presentation focuses on that broader revision part of the editing process um, when you're working on your capstone. And um, as Beth mentioned, we have quite a few resources um, that uh, one of my colleagues had developed that are great um, and, and compiled here. Um, you don't need to open those now, but this could be helpful to you. This just kind of supplements the material we're talking about today. Um, and relevant to this section in particular are the revision strategies document down in the files pod and the revision checklist. But again, you don't need to open those now unless you want to. We're going to be covering a lot of the same and related content. Um, it's more for you to use later um, in ways that are convenient for you. All right, so one thing that we stress, I think you may have seen this kind of graphic before if you've been to any of our presentations about, say, writing the literature review or um, approaching revision to your work. We try to encourage people to think about um, writing and revision with the capstone not as a linear process where you're, you know, collecting your information or data, organizing it, outlining it, writing it, submitting it, and boom, you're done, um, unfortunately. That's typically not the case uh, with something like a capstone um, with all of its many phases and stages. Um, instead, it tends to be an iterative process and more circular so that you're collecting and generating information, gathering data, you know, searching the literature, etc. Organizing all that um, into sections and subsections for your writing, and that involves some outlining, and then you're writing the draft. Um, and then when you have material drafted, you're reading it, you're sending it to other people to read, and then typically you have gaps to fill and you're going back and starting that process again. And so a corollary to that idea, you know, of this being an iterative, uh, an iterative process is that you will be revisiting things. Um, and there's no reason to try to write that elusive, perfect first draft. Um, of the various sections of your document. You should be planning to go back into it. Um, so revision is really a key component and arguably the most important component in that process of writing the capstone. And so part of that, of course, and this sounds a bit preachy, but you know, is, is something that I have had to learn that I am probably still learning um, in my own writing is budgeting enough time not just for getting the ideas down, but for doing that revision work where your work can really start to make sense and shine um, and be at its best. Um, a part of that usually is taking some time away from it, you know, getting sleep, allowing your ideas to percolate, um, and leaving room in your schedule to rework what you've written. So, 
what are the global or big picture concerns involved in revision? Um, these are the ones that are, affect the draft overall. Um, they require abstract, kind of broad conceptual thinking, I find, which is why um, just being the person that I am, if I am going through a document to really, you know, and, and I've been an editor for, gosh, uh, academic editor in APA for 16 years, which is kind of embarrassing. Um, but I will tell you, if I have to go in a document and I want to produce perfect APA, I'm going to do fabulous proofreading. I cannot think about meaning at all <laughs> because I think that the kind of abstract thought that's involved in meaning development and content development, it, I, I think of it as a very separate thing in a lot of ways. And I think that may be true for many people than doing that, you know, fussing over APA details and so forth. Um, and then I think critical reading, critical assessment, um, idea development are all part of that abstract process that really plays into revision. Um, so some of the things you think about at that stage is, as I said before, are you meeting all the requirements of your program? Are you um, presenting everything you need to present? Um, how are you organizing you know, that argument and content? Are you following the rubrics and checklists for your program? You know, is the idea development in your literature review logical or, you know, is it kind of all over the place? Um, are the main ideas emerging from the individual paragraphs and then from the sections that those paragraphs compose? Um, will readers understand what those main ideas are? Um, and are you seeing, you know, patterns of things that you want to fix or change as you're reading, you know, with this in mind? So developing re revision skills will be an ongoing process um, throughout the capstone for most writers. I would say throughout life for people who are doing writing on any level. Um, and, you know, as I think, and I'm sure that you've developed those skills um, in previous academic work, you know, to get to this doctoral stage. Um, so, you know, you probably are aware of some of your strengths and weaknesses as a writer. And using revision effectively means, you know, really keeping those in mind um, and looking critically at your work to see where you might want to adjust that. You know, are you being too flowery and wordy? You know, or do you have a tendency to be so terse and using such short you know, clipped phrasing that, you know, the writing is, you know, perhaps not as interesting as it could be, or, you know, perhaps doesn't have enough details so that people understand what you're referring to. Um, you know, are you good at crafting paragraphs and making them clearly co cohere around the main idea? Or, um, or do they tend to be a little more awkward or scattered? Um, being aware of those strengths and weaknesses can help you figure out what to focus on in these revision passes. Um, I would say strongly from my own experience um, as someone who is reading other people's work um, frequently that being a peer reviewer, being an editor basically, of, you know, whether it's officially or informally um, for other students or, you know, friends and family, I think can be highly instructive in, you know, teaching you ways to look at a document, um, ways to be critical. Um, ways to be constructive and rework something um, or make suggestions that you can then apply to your own revision process with yourself. Um, and part of that process then, and I think the usefulness of peer review, is that it gets you into your work as a reader um, and not necessarily as the writer. It kind of defamiliarizes, you know, defamiliarizing your text can be very useful in finding what you might need to do to make that um, revision as effective as you can. Um, and we have in some of the files in the file pod on revision strategies and so forth, we have some different strategies there that you can try to get that distance from your work that I think can be really productive when you're thinking about, um, you know, how it flows, how it sounds, how the ideas are coming across. Um, one thing that I do uh, that people who have lived with me don't necessarily enjoy, but I find very helpful, is when I'm editing something, whether it's my own or someone else's, um, reading that aloud during one of, the pro one of the passes, I think is really helpful in that, uh, one, it slows you down enough to really see every 
every word on the page. So in that sense, it's useful for proofreading and for revision. It kind of slows you down to really attend to what's there if you have to read the words individually. Um, it also kind of allows you to get into a different modality and I think by kind of hearing it, you know, rather than simply reading it, uh, you know, you're engaging with it in a slightly different way, if that's, you know, an option for you. Um, so reading that document aloud or having it read to you can be helpful in that way. One just practical thing that, that I rely on absolutely every day is changing some of the settings in Microsoft Word uh, when I'm revising a document and actually what I'm writing to. Um, part of this is that, you know, I'm over 40, I wear bifocals, you know, I can't necessarily see the computer that well after staring at it for hours. Um, but also, I think for really looking at text, um, it can be helpful to, uh, you know, have that look, at, look certain ways or sometimes different ways um, on the computer. So for me, that means zooming in, using settings in Microsoft Word in the view section um, so that it's a, for me, I used to do 150%, now I do 175 um, because that's what I need to see all of those little spaces and periods and semicolons and so on accurately. Um, but there are various things that you can do and so I would encourage you to experiment with the settings in Word um, and all the ways that you you can change the way the document looks without actually changing the document and thus tend to be in the view area. So the next few slides cover some specific revision strategies um, that you can use and I think of these as like you could apply one of these strategies within a specific pass through a section of your document or the document as a whole um, and that could be a productive approach. So the first one of these strategies has to do with those degree requirements that are going to be specific to your program. And while we can't really speak to those in detail um, as writing specialists at Walden, because that's really the domain of the individual programs and departments, um, we can direct you to where you can find those materials. There's a link on this slide if you download the slides to the Office of Student Research Administration that has, I believe, over on the left of that page, links to all of the doctoral programs where you can get to the various checklists and rubrics and so on that are going to be used to evaluate the content and structure of your doctoral writing. Um, and those can be really helpful, you know, as you're structuring each part um, of your document. Uh, one thing I think that isn't on the slide, but that's part of that, um, is by using the template uh, for your specific program, which you can get on our form and style website. Um, that has less information about content in it. However, it does tend to have the basic skeleton of the document there in terms of the, um, you know, certainly the major chapters. And then depending on the program, sometimes some of those required subheadings are in there. Um, and that can be, you know, really helpful in, you know, thinking about which components you need to add. But the rubrics and checklists from the Office of Student Research Administration are really the critical documents outlining content. So a way that you can leverage that when you're doing revision um, is, you know, using, having like the, whether you like it electronically or uh, print it out in a hard copy, having, you know, the checklist or rubric document or documents um, with you while you're reviewing your draft. Um, and then you might, uh, depending on your own preferences, develop some kind of system for tracking whether you've met all of those requirements. So that might mean, um, you know, using the comments tool in Microsoft Word to note in the margins what the checklist or guide requires for each section that in your in your document. Um, and then noting to yourself whether you have completed that or not. Um, you know, of course, you can also print things out and write by hand, you know, on the rubric document itself or on your document, but find a system that works for you um, so that you can, you know, really use that to best advantage to guide your revision process. And there's a link on this slide here if you download the slides about um, the link to the Academic Skills Center's Microsoft Word resources where you'll find more information about how to use um, 
comments in Microsoft Word and other tools that could be helpful to you in this process. Now the second revision strategy that I wanted to cover um, has to do with paragraph development and I think that's a um, that's a major issue for a lot of writers um, and it goes really to the heart of creating a you know a, a clear coherent document um, and one that where the ideas flow in a way that readers can follow and that's engaging for readers as well and so this revision strategy is focused on looking at those paragraphs um, and thinking about what cert what function each one is serving um, so as we were talking about in the previous section, for some parts of your draft, depending on your program, the requirements and the rubric or checklist may be pretty prescriptive. And so the guide and checklist may be giving you a pretty clear idea of what your paragraphs are going to be addressing in the various sections, um, certainly of some areas of your draft. And, and the programs really vary on the level of specificity. Uh, that those rubrics and checklists provide, but but often there is quite a bit of information there about um, some of those subsections you need, particularly in, you know, say the introductory chapter um, and what you might need to be saying um, in those subsections. But then for other parts of the draft, like the literature review, you really are going to have to come up with the organization yourself. Um, there's the most of the structure of the literature review beyond where you talk about, you know, say how you did your research in the library and how you organized your sources and how many you used and so forth. There might be prescriptive information about that um, as well as how you talk about, say, your conceptual or theoretical framework um, in your rubric documents. But typically when you get to the meat of the literature review where you're really talking about that um, content from the literature that's that informed your own study, you're kind of on your own in figuring out how to structure that. Um, so <clears throat> that's where, you know, really careful paragraph development um, and outlining can be can be really important in getting that structure to be logical and effective. Um, now we talk about um, the importance of paragraph organization within each paragraph, and then also the connection of ideas between paragraphs. For the within the paragraph um, structure, there's something that we often refer to at the Writing Center, but that I believe was developed um, at Duke University um, at their Writing Center called the Meal Plan. Um, and that is a way to organize paragraphs that I think can be extremely helpful in academic writing specifically, especially when you're talking about the literature, when you're dealing with evidence from the literature. Um, and and it, it's not a structure you absolutely have to use with every paragraph. Um, there's no rule <laughs> that you must. However, I think that it is extremely helpful in making sure, especially if you're struggling with coherence in your paragraphs and with organization in general, it can be very helpful in making sure that you have all of the elements that you need. And so the next slide shows an example, and I don't know how well you can see the specific content here, um, but of what the what a meal plan paragraph might look like. And meal is an acronym, so M is main idea, E is evidence, A is analysis, and L is lead out. And so this example shows um, what that might look like. So the main idea is like your thesis or topic sentence. Um, often that's at the beginning, it doesn't have to be, but the beginning is a convenient place. Um, and uh, and so in, in this paragraph here, um, the main idea sentence is, multiple studies have indicated a strong link between transportation availability and student engagement in ex extracurricular activities. And so everything else in this paragraph needs to be in support and related to in some way that main idea sentence. Um, and I would say that whether you're using meal plan or not, um, each of your paragraphs really needs to cohere around some clear focus or main idea. Um, and that is one of the most common things when I'm advising people earlier in write, the writing stages before the form and style review, sometimes at the form and style review, um, is that if the argument is difficult to follow, often it is a function of 
paragraphs not having a single clear focus and by going through and reordering things a bit so that you really make sure that there is some clear topic you can draw out of each one um, you can go a great deal of the way toward making a more coherent argument so then the evidence which is in green in this picture and I won't read all this out are those facts from the literature and in this case there's some statistics some statements um, along with citations um, that are supporting that main idea conveyed in red at the beginning of the paragraph. And then um, just presenting evidence is not enough in academic writing to have a meaningful synthesis, um, you know, at the doctoral level. And I'm sure you've heard about this in other content um, in other courses and, and writing center materials. Um, that synthesis element needs to be there where you're relating the literature to each other um, and importantly to your own work. And that's what's in blue um, in, in this meal illustration. That's the analysis piece. Um, so you can see there's phrases like um, you know, something was similar to findings in studies across the country. Um, there's another place where the writer here is saying it's explaining some of the evidence in green by there's this blue statement, uh, you know, explaining what that evidence means. Um, when you're analyzing something, you're making links um, between, between ideas, between sources, uh, connections to your own work, and interpreting information for your readers. Um, and then uh, in purple at the end of the paragraph is that lead out sentence. And that can, that can mean a variety of things that you don't have to, I think people sometimes think they have to say, in my next paragraph, I'm going to talk about X. Um, and you really don't have to do that. Often it's best not to that can be kind of repetitive and but there but the function of the lead out sentence is to give something that gives you a sense of either summarizing and wrapping up the ideas in the paragraph that you've just presented um, and or you know a kind of pivot to the next idea that feels natural um, so that can take a variety of forms and we have lots of great information on our website about the meal plan lots more examples um, in materials. So if this is an area where you feel like you would like to do some more development, um, I'd strongly encourage you to visit that. And there's a link here on this slide that you can use when you download the slide deck. So once you have your material written out, say you have material written out, you're revising, and you're being honest with yourself and thinking, okay, you know, the revision of uh, the structure of this part of my literature review is not the greatest. You know, I'm getting some feedback from faculty that, you know, I'm missing some steps here. This doesn't make, you know, some of the connections between these ideas aren't clear. Um, you can kind of go at that uh, as a sort of reverse outline by looking at the focus of your paragraphs. Um, and that can kind of help you then have a structure that you can use to maybe make a better outline that becomes the structure for the next draft of your work. Um, and so as this slide explains, one way that you can approach that is by creating an actual reverse outline by noting in the margins, either by hand or using comments maybe or some other structure, um, the main idea of each paragraph. Um, making sure there is one, I guess, you know, adjusting it as needed. And then noting what that main idea is um, and then why it belongs in your section or subsection. And I um, apologize for that. Um, and then you want to create an outline based on those notes so that you can visualize what's in your draft, uh, where you need to elaborate or reorganize, uh, and where you might condense or combine material. Um, all right. Okay, so the final revision strategy uh, is driven by the feedback that you'll be receiving from faculty, um, you know, possibly from writing center staff at various points, um, or you know, other people who would be reading your work. Um, as I said earlier, and as you've probably already experienced, uh, you're going to be receiving different feedback from different people um, throughout the capstone process um, at different stages, and and that can be sometimes you know a little challenging to reconcile um, all the different feedback in a way that allows you to keep moving forward, um, you know, allows you to really perfect your work, um, and while satisfying, you know, the wishes of the people that 
um, are responsible for overseeing that work. Um, and those faculty are going to be looking at and thinking about different things every time they look at your draft, uh, following the same kind of process that we talked about for revision. So you'll need a way to keep track of the different sources of feedback um, that you've had and the comments that you've received and how you plan to address that feedback in your own revisions. So when you get a, uh, something back with feedback on it, it's of course important to read over all the comments carefully. And, um, and then when you're thinking about not those granular, you know, APA and, uh, you know, proofreading level errors, but the big errors, it can be useful to make a list of the global big picture concerns uh, that your faculty would like you to address. And then one way that you can go back through your document in a revision pass might be to note in the margins each time that you see that issue or pattern of error in your draft um, so that you can think about how to fix that. Um, and then develop a strategy for how best to address those concerns. Okay, so I know that was a lot of information um, about uh, different ideas for revision. Uh, the next section is going to be on proofreading, um, which are those more granular uh, issues in the draft. And so preparing for that, I'm curious, which errors in terms of proofreading do you find it the most difficult to identify and correct? And you should see a number of choices. OK, it looks like a few responses are still coming in. But I see that we have a winner this time, although the, I'd say the votes, oh, well, vote is more, more evenly split than the last poll. Um, but it looks like the winner so far is grammar errors, um, verb tense and sentence structure. And while we won't be talking about specific errors in this session, um, we will be guiding you to some uh, resources that should be useful to you and some ideas um, more strategically about how to approach that task. Um, and how to leverage those resources to make it worthwhile. Uh, word choice and word meaning errors. And that's interesting, too. I see that one's almost as many people um, said that. And that does get to be, I think, a complex and sometimes kind of time-consuming revision task. And that's where it can be helpful, too, to have a peer reviewer um, or another set of eyes, I think, on your work. I also see citations and references in APA. Um, I know that is a big one. There's so many rules. Fortunately, we do have lots of concrete resources um, that you can use toward that end that I think make it a little more manageable. And uh, layout and template stuff. I see you got some votes, too. So thank you. Thank you for filling that out. That's um, very interesting for me to see. All right, so we're going to be talking in this section about proofreading and polishing your capstone draft. Um, and there's some resources highlighted here on this slide that you can download later. Well, you can get them now. They're in the files pod, but you don't need to look at them now. We're not using them for the presentation. Um, but I think they can be useful. Um, there's a grammar, grammar journal. Um, if grammar is your particular um, issue that you're dealing with a lot in feedback and revisions, um, the grammar journal can be a helpful structure to keep track of those things that you're working on, um, revising and mastering in your work. Um, and there's an example there, too. And there's a proofreading tips document that compiles some of the things that we're going to be talking about in the next few slides. OK, so um, one thing I, I always like to stress is that everybody has to proofread. Um, you know, even professional writers and editors, maybe especially. Um, <clears throat> I know whenever I'm feeling like I'm, if I get overconfident, if I don't spend that time proofreading, I will find dumb things that I left uh, in text. Um, and it, it definitely happens. So it's something everybody has to do. It's, you know, not always fun, although it can be. Um, and now one thing that I, I often advise people to do, and this, I said this in the previous session, section, um, is to wait until you're happy with that content before you start doing the really granular level polishing. Um, if you're having to rework um, entire paragraphs, take things out, put things in, 
it can be really frustrating if you spend a lot of time, you know, honing your APA style. Um, so it, ideally, you know, get your content resolved and at least the basic structure down before doing that, you know, more fine tooth comb work. Um, and then of course it was for it, just make sure you budgeted the time for it. Um, it's almost always more time than you think it's going to be. This is a long document, proofreading's detailed, etc. You know this. Um, and you know, as someone who edits for a living, I do have to put in a, a plea that the electronic tools, and there's a lot out there, they can be very helpful and, and I recommend them. Things like, you know, your spelling grammar check in Word, Grammarly, um, you know, various tools like that can all be very helpful in guiding your revision. But unfortunately, we're not at a point where the software has a level of sophistication that it substitutes for you um, and, you know, maybe other readers going line by line through your document. So some of the local or small picture proofreading concerns are these, you know, are the citations formatted correctly? Um, is the grammar and sentence structure correct? Um, are there only complete sentences? Um, is the punctuation free of errors? Um, is the wording precise? Are the, the best and correct words chosen? Um, and is the style formal enough? Does it sound academic without sounding unclear, so pretentious or, you know, overblown that it's unclear? Um, have you followed all the formatting requirements for, you know, the like formal margins and headings and all those kinds of things in your document? Those are some of the things that you would think about. Um, so just as with revision, uh, being self-aware about the kinds of errors you tend to make can really help you f figure out where to focus your proofreading process. That grammar journal that I mentioned can be helpful in keeping track of specific things if, if grammar is your struggle. Um, you might make your own kind of style guide cheat sheet, and that could just be a list you know, of things that you've gotten feedback that you're having errors in these areas something that you can be looking at when you're doing your proofreading pass through your document. That can be very helpful. Um, and again, you know, doing those things to see your work as a reader rather than as the writer or to defamiliarize your work in some way can be very helpful. Reading aloud, zooming in on the text. Um, there's, you can change settings, and I unfortunately can't show this here, but to, so that you can see the spaces and the formatting marks, that can sometimes be helpful. Um, all those things can be helpful at, at really polishing and refining the draft. And then, you know, another key part of this is knowing where you can look up answers to things like how to format certain kinds of APA references or citations. Instead of feeling like you have that burden of memorizing everything, you really don't. And there are still, after 16 years in APA style, there are still things that I have to look up because I have, I feel like, and I justify that by thinking I am outsourcing the storage of some of this information to, you know, my um, ebook of the APA manual or the Writing Center website because I just, you know, I need that storage space in my brain for something else. So if there's a, you know, a certain kind of obscure government document that I only see you know, once every few months, you know, I'm going to go look that up um, to know how to format that reference. And so, you know, I would. It's probably common sense, but I would encourage you to do the same. And then, um, and you know, this is repeating some of what I've said, but uh, as with revision, I think it's very productive to plan to proofread in multiple passes. Think about how you can break that down. And, um, and this list here is an example. You know, you're going to break that down according to what you can reasonably do in a single pass and, and what's important to you and what your specific challenges are. But this is an example of what I do, you know, when I'm proofreading something for myself or someone else. Um, during one pass, I'm reading line by line, and I'm thinking about things like, you know, sentence structure, grammar, coherence, clarity, and that all tends to happen naturally. My brain wants to do those things sort of simultaneously. Um, but I might not see all of, like, every misspelled word when I'm interacting with the text that way. I might not see all the punctuation errors. And so running a spell check or grammar check after that I find useful to catch some of those things. Um, and, you know, perhaps after I've read line by line. And that sometimes catches some of the loose ends that I've missed. Um, and then after that, uh, what I've done before when I used to edit more 
professionally or freelance before I was at Walden and I would really be responsible for helping somebody get their document as perfect as it could possibly be. Um, I would take a separate pass where I went through and looked for each citation um, to make sure that everything was consistent. One way to do that, just as a hint, um, is to search for the opening parentheses, um, and that will allow you to find most, um, you know, in text if you've got the year there, um, and parenthetical citations in your document. Um, another thing that everyone should do, and I know, you know, doesn't always happen, but it, it should, <laughs> um, is that in APA style, anything that's in your reference list, you should be citing in the text. Um, that's the APA approach. Um, it's not a bibliography where you include things that you don't cite. Um, you should be citing everything. So everything in your reference list should have a citation. Um, and every citation, importantly, should have a reference, um, unless it's a personal communication or some kind of thing that is not retrievable where you wouldn't have a reference list entry, um, that is the rare case. Otherwise, there should be a reference entry. So, so those kinds of things, citation checking, can be a separate pass. Um, and then usually the final thing that I do with any document, and this is true when I do a form and style review and I'm fixing things for people and giving feedback on how to fix it themselves, the last thing I usually do once I've made all those changes, which move things around and are going to change the pagination and the headings and stuff, once all that's done, then I scroll through it to check the layout formatting to make sure it meets all the guidelines in the template, you know, or the margins right. Um, you know, I usually check that first and then I just scroll and make sure the page break's falling in the right place, and then at the end I'll do the table of contents. So that's one way you might go about that. Um, now we have a lot of proofreading resources um, in and outside the Writing Center, and these are um, these are highlighted here on this slide. Um, there's that proofreading tips and grammar journal in the files pod that I referred to. Um, there's a link here to Grammarly, which you can use. Um, that's, again, a totally automated tool. It doesn't really substitute for, um, you know, what a person could tell you about their work. But it is good at identifying if you have certain pervasive patterns of grammatical error or writing error. It can be very helpful in pointing that out to you so that you know what to look at when you're self-editing. Um, so that's linked here. Uh, of course, the APA manual uh, is very important. Um, for those weird kinds of APA problems that you don't know how to fix, the APA style blog um, is a great resource, and that's linked here. It's searchable, and so when I have a source that, or something I don't know how to do in APA style because the manual doesn't really address it directly, a lot of the time it will be addressed in their blog, and so that's a great place to go. Um, the Merriam-Webster's Dictionary is the source for words that could be spelled more than one way. Um, if in doubt, uh, APA says to go to Merriam-Webster. There's a link to that here. And then there's a link to some of our um, many resources on proofreading and revising um, for grammar that we have at the Writing Center. Okay, um, and we're going to pause to have a chat um, as we're kind of wrapping up. Um, and I, while these are coming in, um, Sam, if there are any questions, that I can answer. I know there's a lot of content in this session. I had hoped to stop. Yeah, ac actually, Carrie, I've been pretty busy in the uh, Q&A box here. <laughs> a lot of people asking yeah. really good questions. Um, one, one that came up just now, a couple questions have come up about track changes, and one came up about something related to that. Um, a student wanted to know um, if there's some sort of, um, I don't know the exact word, that they use the original question is not there, but sort of a separate document that records comments from reviewer along with the changes made, and for each comment from each reviewer, and then once completed. I'm not sure, I'm not aware of anything outside of track changes, in terms of tracking um, uh, tracking revisions. Other than I mean I, I I suggested you know saving archived versions uh, with uh, maybe with the date so you know which which one is which and using track changes, but are you aware of anything else they could do there? Yeah, Any other that tools? is a really great question, and I bet that there's some, I know there's a number of different ways that you can view your track changes in Microsoft Word um, that could be helpful in pulling that out, like there are different panes that show um, 
you know, the revisions in different ways, but to be honest with you, I think I have blinders on maybe because I deal with this, you know, in the form and style review and the work that we do, we deal with such a specific part of the process for mm -hmm. um, students' revisions that I don't, yeah. I'm often not trying to reconcile all those different things. Uh, yeah, I know. I see actually that there is a uh, comment from uh, Beth in the presenter chat that she's saying this student might be referring to a form that illustrates changes they made for the faculty. So um, this may be something that faculty are directing them to. So in, if, if that's the case, you know, there are many things that faculty are doing that we're not simply not aware of uh, and we can't be aware of them all. So they might want to talk to their faculty about what their what tools the faculty is hoping that they'll use. Yeah, if you if do have fine. anything, if any of you have any tools like yeah. that, um, I would love to, and it's something you're allowed to share, I'd love to see it. You can send it to us at editor at waldenu.edu. I know we'd be curious. Um, to see it, you're welcome to mention me. Um, oh, and I hadn't actually read out the chat question. Um, it's if you wanted to share any proofreading or revising tricks or tools that you suggest, um, or if you want to note anything that you're interested in trying after this session, um, you can just put those right in the chat box. Oh, and I see, awesome. yeah, change matrix was used in the DBA program. That's interesting. Yeah, I have, um, we have, uh, some people in the Writing Center who are um, kind of cross-listed in the DBA program, so I will ask them about that because I think that's very interesting. Um, and I think that might be, something like that might be helpful in uh, helping students at earlier stages of this process for me. So, oh, and I a see related uh, question. someone says they're doing the meal plan. Okay, I'll go ahead, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry, just a related question on the track changes. Another student asked earlier, and I, I gave my, my thoughts, but I was wondering if you'd like to comment on this as well. Um, about using track changes as they are revising. Now, I, I know that uh, their faculty and we, of course, are using track changes when we make edits or suggest changes, but do you recommend, or, or maybe when do you think it would be best for a student to be using track changes in their own revision process? Well, I guess my recommendation would be to be as transparent as you can in talking to the faculty that you're submitting to mm -hmm. about what their expectations about that are, because I can see how it would be useful to see have track changes on when you're doing your own your own revisions to demonstrate mm -hmm. that you have gone in and done that work. Um, yeah. So just on that level, it could be helpful. The one thing that I will say, um, just on a practical level dealing with the document, is that, um, you know, I, what I usually recommend people do after you get, say, a marked up document with track changes and comments um, is to go through, like individually, make sure you're addressing each comment, make sure yes. that you want to keep the changes, and then, you know, delete the comments from the document once you've addressed them and turn in and clear and accept all of the changes. It will just make your document a lot cleaner and easier to deal with going forward. When you've got multiple generations of track changes in one document, it can be you know, awful to try to sort out if you do want to go back and, you know, try to figure out what the history of some change was. Um, it, it can be many layered and painful. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, yeah, I think I just try to, if I feel like in my own writing, if I feel like a, a revision is kind of settled, um, that there isn't going to be question about it, I go ahead and, you know, accept that change, get it out of the way so it's not distracting me for other things. And I see some great feedback uh, in the chat box. Um, yeah, uh, someone says reading the paper aloud uh, has led to many good revisions, and that's for clarity and coherence. It's great. The meal plan again. We always have a. The meal plan is so helpful. Um, I've really been a convert to that, and I'm someone who sometimes resists, you know, little acronym tricks for writing. But that one is a really helpful one for academic writing. I. I really endorse it. Um, having someone read their paper to them, it sounds good, reading out loud, having someone else proofread. Um, yeah, um, great. Uh, are there other questions? I know where I have a, a, a resource slide, I think, to show that I want to get to before the hour's up. Um, no, I, I, I think you should, hanging. I think you can go ahead. Um, I think that, that addresses most of them. I got a couple loose ends to tie up in the Q&A, but you go ahead. Okay, all right. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, and thank you to all of you who have been contributing ideas in chat. 
asking questions. Um, I see a couple people are typing. I'm going to let you get your um, comments in, and then I will uh, show the last few slides, which are mostly some links that I'd encourage you to use once you download um, these slides so that you can um, use any of our resources that you're not already using. Okay. Okay, and someone's asking about the change matrix. It sounds like the change matrix is a DBA program structure. That's actually news to me. I'm excited um, to see what that is. It sounds like it's a way of keeping track of your feedback. But that is something the DBA program apparently does, and that's according to you all. <laughs> so um, I'm going to be asking uh, some of my colleagues who teach in the DBA program to share that with me, because um, it sounds cool. But I'm afraid I cannot tell you much about that. Um, but maybe you could tell uh, each other. OK. All right, I'm going to uh, just go on to the resources so that um, so that you can uh, see what we have to offer. Um, there's a link here to the Foreman Style website. That's the um, kind of offshoot of the Writing Center website that is run by the Office of Academic Editing, where I work. Um, and we have all of the templates compiled here. We have lots of. Um, writing and revision kits and checklists full of other resources um, and links to all sorts of great things. Um, the form and style checklist is something I would encourage you to come get um, from us at the form and style website. That will um, tell you all the things that we are going to be looking at um, when we look at your document during the form and style review. And so that can be helpful actually in guiding some of these revisions um, as you are moving along. Um, just a few other resources to highlight here um, that I think are especially useful at our site and elsewhere. Um, some of my colleagues have developed these wonderful SMART guides. Um, those are uh, pretty um, clear, concise how-to documents for doing some of the more onerous and common, <laughs> but common, uh, tasks that you have to do in a capstone, like formatting a figure or creating a table. Um, there's a whole bunch of different SMART guides, and those are linked here. Um, we have a new self-editing section full of resources, ideas, tips, and um, content on the Form and Style website, um, and that's linked here. Um, we have a live chat service that <clears throat> I'd encourage you to use because we don't get that many visitors yet, to be frank, um, and I'm always happy to talk to people. It's meant as a quick Q&A, but um, if you've got, uh, you know, some APA questions, some simple basic writing questions, format questions, that kind of thing, um, please come visit us. And those are linked here. That's a live chat service during certain hours. Um, there are also doctoral capstone writing workshops run by the Academic Skills Center. And there's a link here for the Doctoral Capstone Resources Hub, which compiles resources across Walden Centers. If you have questions um, after the webinar, please feel free to write us anytime at editor at waldenu.edu or visit us during our chat hours, um, as I mentioned on the last slide. And um, I don't want to go over, so that is that is what I have. Um, Beth, did you have any concluding comments? Thanks so much, Carrie. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I guess I would just say thank you, everyone, for God. <coughs> excuse me again. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, I will be posting the recording in uh, the webinar archive within 24 hours, so you're welcome to access um, the slides there as well as the recording, so feel free to do that as well. And I know we had a couple questions just at the end, so if you do have any lingering questions, as Carrie said, please do email uh, us at editor at waldenu.edu. And other than that, we hope to see you at another webinar. Thanks so much to you, Carrie. And uh, to Sam, thank you for all your work in the, the Q&A box, and I'll go ahead and end for the day. Thanks, everyone.